been evolved for us to be conscious. And this is said a lot in the literature, in, in the field. Um, and today I want to play the role of a bit of a skeptic. I want to see what is it really true. I mean, so we, we like to think like consciousness has evolved for higher, you know, cognitive, uh, higher intelligent animals. Is it even true? I think that this seems true intuitively. And again, also things that have evolved to be a property does not necessarily have any special function. One of my favorite examples is the chin. So we know that we have chins and, and monkeys don't seem to have chins and dogs don't seem to have chin. So a bit of a bone sticking out like that. So you can say, well, so we are intelligent and we have chins, so chin must have very special functions. But if you really think about it, it's not really very clear what functions are. And I think evolutionary stories are in general very, very good, but they are not really as strong and as decisive as, as real arguments. They, can, they, they are a good way to understand how things works in general. But uh, if you take that as a strong assumption, that may not be very good, especially in psychology and neuroscience. A lot of things that seem intuitively true, introspectively or theoretically, uh, turn out to be, could be wrong. So today I just want to feel like, well, well, can we actually go through the argument and see whether we can empirically demonstrate what is really the function of consciousness. And, and you can argue a lot about this, and I think that people in general tend to take either extremes. They feel like, okay, let's assume that consciousness has some functions, and it's very hard to falsify those positions. I think it's, it's true. So, so like people like, like L just gave a talk, and I think he tend to believe that consciousness may play a role in those uh, libet experiments. And that probably is true, that if, if, uh, if you assume that's the case, the data doesn't seem to falsify that. But I feel that you can also take the opposite and say, well, let's assume consciousness has no function whatsoever, or maybe it's just like a byproduct, it's like having a chin. Uh, then it seems to me that also it's pretty difficult to, to find data to really falsify that kind of position. So, so it looks as if it's really, a, it's really an open case so far. And, I tried to speculate today a little bit how do we actually approach the pro this problem empirically and as give you some preliminary data how we can actually do this. The bottom line is I don't think we actually know yet, but I think we are really getting very close to be able to say something meaningfully about this. So one of those functions that I, that I talk about or, or we assume that consciousness probably is good for, and like many people have said, it may, it may not be for simple actions, but for more complex stuff like thinking, deciding who to marry, uh, planning, planning to like something long term, whether you want to go to graduate school, planning about your career, uh, or in, in the literature, in, in the psychological literature, sometimes we call it some, some kind of task, cognitive control task. I'm going to go into a bit, a bit in a bit a minute. So these are more higher complex stuff that seems to be, you know, intelligent beings seem to be able to do, whereas low, kind of sim simpler creatures don't seem to be able to do. And that, we think that that probably is what consciousness is for. I think we all have an intuition like that. But of course, that may not be true. Again, introspectively, it looks like it doesn't mean that it's really true. And here's an example of cognitive control, which I promise I'll give you a more specific example. So this is about like slightly over 10 years ago, uh, Diane and Akash proposed that actually this is maybe one specific function of consciousness. So what is cognitive control really is the control of cognition. So you can have a first order cognition such as mapping a stimulus to a response. So if I tell you, well, I'm gonna utter some words uh, after this and, and uh, like maybe numbers and then you have to judge whether a number word is, uh, is monosyllabic or bisyllabic. Right, because one is monosyllabic, seven is bisyllabic, two syllables, right? So then you can map a certain stimulus to a certain response. You can use this hand is monosyllabic, and that's hand, this hand means bisyllabic. So you map the numbers, you map the stimulus to the response. And once you have that mapping established, you know what you're doing. Then you have a cognitive chain, and apparently you then unconscious information can work. So if I present to you a number like seven subliminally, that is below the threshold for conscious perception, it can actually activate the, the, the relevant motor representation. So it seems that to just to do this task of classifying a stimulus into bisyllabic or monosyllabic does not really require consciousness. I mean, or, or it seems that unconscious information can drive some of this task. That is fine. And what these people have suggested is, however, if you switch between a different task, let's say now I don't want you to judge whether the word is bisyllabic or monosyllabic, I want you to judge whether the word refers to a concrete object or not. So it's a completely different task. They map completely differently from different stimuli to different uh, response. To switch between these tasks, though, you need to be conscious. 
So you need to be consciously engaged to do this task. And they call it an impossible situation that you cannot have an unconscious information presented that, that would trigger the switching of the task. So, so that actually, well, it looks pretty reasonable, right? So a certain first order cognition, it can become automatic, become muscle memory, a word becomes a, a, a number. But to actually switch to a different task, completely remap, that seems to be a, a control of the cognition or control of the like, kind of like a higher order process. That seems to require consciousness and you cannot have unconscious information driving that. And I was a skeptic then uh, because I feel, you know, this is really predicting a null result, right? What, what, what this kind of evidence you would have is, let's say you actually make it like a task. So here you, you see this stimulus, like a, I call this a diamond. And you see this diamond, which is on, on the left, and, and then, okay, that diamond means that you now have to do a phonological task. You judge whether a word is bisyllabic or not. And then romance, so that would be a yes. Romance is two syllables, so it's bisyllabic. And then you, if you see this square, then you have to uh, prepare for the semantic task. Like I just talked about, you have to judge whether the upcoming word refers to a concrete object or not. And romance is, is not so concrete for myself. So I would say no. And, uh, and, and then so when you see the stimulus, you, you, you know what task to prepare. And then the, the, the idea is if, if you were not conscious in seeing this stimulus, that this, this is presented subliminally, then you should not be able to prepare to do these tasks. You would just do what tasks you have been doing. You would not be able to switch to the new task or something. That would be the idea, but then you're predicting a null result, right? Because you're really trying to present this very briefly or, or, very, uh, or mask it or do something funny about this stimulus to make it not consciously perceivable. Then you would say, well, then there should be no above chance effect. Then you should not benefit for, for this. You would not behave, as you, your performance would be as if you did not, this was not presented at all. So you're, you're predicting a null result, and null result, you know, is, is, is weak because in general, lack of evidence does not not, maybe you, you need more subjects to show a positive effect. Maybe you need to do it more properly, etc. So I tried to think, well, maybe I can do it more properly. And it was done a few years ago. I was kind of a skeptic, and I tried to challenge the status quo then. And, uh, and then what we did was, uh, let, me, let me first say, I, the experiment worked, but I, I, I now have reservations about this. But uh, the experiment was this. So you actually do this uh, square and diamond figure. And this is, I call the explicit instruction. So you're explicitly cued to do uh, semantic, uh, phonological here and semantic there. And before that, there was a small shape that was presented. There's also a square and diamond. And this so smaller and solid figure actually go right into this hollow shape here. So the explicit figure actually completely uh, uh, would overlap with the contour of these guys. Does that make sense? So the primes actually go, go into, oh, sorry, go into the shape here. And that is what we call is, is, is a kind of situation of meta contrast masking. So without going into details, whatever, the, 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 the upshot is really that the explicit instruction figure here would reduce the visibility of these primes. So if you play with this SOA, the stimulus onset asynchrony, there's a timing between, uh, between the, the prime and the, and the instructions well enough. If you, play, if you play with the timing, under certain situations, you would completely not see the prime. Uh, how do you know they not see? Well, you first of all, you ask them, did you see the prime? They said, like, what are you talking about? And then you also ask them, well, now I, I tell you there is a prime. I show you a slow uh, movie of this. So you see that well, there is actually a figure was exactly in there. And now try to tell me whether it's square or diamond and, and do 100 trials, just make your best guess. Then they are completely a chance. Right? So, so they really don't see this uh, prime figure, so the prime was invisible. So the idea is this. So now if you take a situation where you're being explicitly told to do the uh, semantic, uh, the phonological task, let's say this, uh, this, this the diamond case. If I present you with a different figure, a prime of a square, then the idea is that you'll be tricked to do the alternative task. So you actually unconsciously prepare for one task and consciously prepare for the other. Then supposedly your performance will be worse, right? Because you're kind of unconsciously preparing to do the phonological, but explicitly you do the semantic. And there are different mappings, so sometimes you give different response. So presumably you might be slower and you'll be worse uh, in, in your accuracy in actually doing the, uh, the, the word judgment. And it turned out to be true. So this is accuracy here. So this is, when I say con, it means congruent. So the prime is congruent with the explicit instruction, so they're the same. And incon means that they're incongruent, so they're different. And uh, so you see that when they are different, actually your, your, your accuracy drops, okay? And also your reaction time goes up. So you become slower and you become less accurate. And you can say, well, this may not be so conclusive because you know, maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's just people are just distracted. 
It's not, it's not really that your, your unconscious prime that you presented that really trigger a different task set. It may not, you, you may not be actually preparing for two different tasks, but you're preparing for one task, which is an explicit task. But when you present me with the unconscious shape that is different, it's just kind of distracting and people are just, you know, they're distracted. It's kind of like hitting them on the back. Like bit, it's or playing some loud music in the background. It's distracted, so they're slower and less accurate. So we don't think it's actually true. And one of the reasons is this is an fMRI experiment. We put the people in the fMRI scanner. So we actually monitor the brain activity indirectly using, using functional magnetic resonance imaging when we do this task. And the reason we chose these phonological and semantic tasks is because actually we know before this experiment that they tap into slightly different brain regions. So semantic tasks tend to tap into these like lower regions, kind of near Broca and around Wernicke area, if you're not so familiar with the uh, brain anatomy there, the kind of like a classic language reading network activity. And phonological tasks kind of tap into uh, more of the like ventral premotor area. I mean, they are, it's not like a complete dissociation. It's not like one area only do one task, the other one area only do the other task. Language actually tap into many different regions. But in relative terms, the, the semantic tasks use this, these areas relatively more than the phonological task. And the phonological tasks use this area relatively more than the semantic task. So now that's useful because now we can sort out, you can take the brain activity there and then look at what is task relevant and task irrelevant activity. So what I call task relevant activity would be in the semantic task, when you're being explicitly told to do the semantic task, I look at the, uh, the, these, uh, these activity here that are, that are relatively more uh, recruited by the semantic task. And when you do the phonological task, I look at the phonological activity. So these are task relevant activity. And you can see that when you're being primed from, from being, if, if the primes are congruent, you use the relevant activity this much. And when the task is actually primed to do the incongruent task, you use less of the task relevant activity. Well, that might still be, you're just like distracted, so you're, just, you're less engaged. But you can also look at the task irrelevant activity, which is if, you look, if you're doing a semantic task, I look at your phonological activity. If you're doing the phonological task, I look at your semantic activity. Then you can see that actually when you're being primed to do the alternative task, when you're primed for incongruent, you actually use more of the task irrelevant activity. So it doesn't look like that you're just disengaged. You're actually using the, actively using the wrong neural resources. So that suggests that the prime actually is really triggering you to, to prepare for the wrong task set, which kind of falsify the, the, the early hypothesis that these kind of tasks requires you to be conscious, right? So even, even with an unconscious prime, you seem to be engaging your brain to, to recruit the wrong neural resources. And just a, an additional piece of evidence, if you take the just overall, regardless of what task, just take the situation of comparing uh, congruent primes versus incongruent primes. So what is the extra activity that would be activated when you look at the brain that, that when, you, uh, when you have to prepare for an extra alternative task? It seems that what happens is you, you activate up to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And this region is classic in like working memory, cognitive control, and it's really the highest, kind of one of the highest control areas of the brain. So it seems that, uncon and remember these primes are unconscious. So subjectively, in terms of visual quality, they, they, they should look identical. But some, somehow, unconscious information can activate the brain and trigger the highest cognitive control resources in the brain. So it doesn't look like, because an alternative view I think many people hold is that you have some higher cognitive control areas in the brain, like prefrontal cortex. Those are always only conscious. Only conscious information can exercise them. Unconscious information can kind of activate the periphery, like lower control, uh, basic, uh, neural processing, but it doesn't look like that. It looks like the unconscious information can go all the way into the deepest, highest areas in the brain and, and activate you to do these higher cognitive functions. And I'm happy to say, I mean, subsequently, uh, this task uh, or this kind of experiment using unconscious information to trigger cognitive control has been replicated many times beautifully in, in the lab of Victor Lama by uh, Simon Megal. And they use a different task. They don't use task switching. They mostly do go-no-go -no tasks which is another form of cognitive control because they get you into an automatic situation. You press a button as fast as possible. Sometimes you see the different stimulus, you have to withhold pressing the button. And that kind of inhibitory control also has been assumed to, to require prefrontal cortex, uh, higher monitoring of, of, of self-action, et cetera. And they also seem to be you know, triggerable or kind of recruited or activated exercise by unconscious information. So that's interesting. Um, one thing that one criticism we got is uh, you know, consciousness and attention are very related. 
And when we say unconscious, what we are saying is something very specific. We are saying that the task, the relevant visual information is not perceptually conscious. So you are not, you are not consciously seeing the relevant perceptual information, but still you are actively engaging in the task, right? You're engaged, you're actively attending to the, to the location. You're looking at that very figure because the prime figure was just in the same location, basically. So you're still actively looking. What if things that you're not actively looking? That gets more relevant to real life too, right? I mean, think about all these subliminal advertisements. So that only happens when you're not even looking if you present a little somewhat of a, a brand logo in the peripheral vision, does it actually make you buy the product? I mean, these are the kind of questions that people are interested. So here, this task is a little bit of that flavor. So you actually look at, there's a cue, there's a, the two arrows here that tell you that, well, these are the two relevant motion patches. So these are dot motion patches, the dots are moving up or moving down. And then there is some noise mask together with it too. So you have to pay attention. So you, when you look at, let's say you look at these two patches, then if they are moved, so that you're being cued to, to look at these two patches and ignore these patches. So the, the, uh, this diagonal on the upper right and the lower left, these two patches are irrelevant. You don't have to look at them at all. They're not important to you. And the upper left and lower right, they're important to you. And if these two patches are moving up, then now you have to do one task, which is judge whether the upcoming number is bigger or smaller than five. And if they're moving down, then you have to judge whether the upcoming number is odd or even. So it's fairly difficult because you, know, you have to switch and, and it's pretty quick. So you have to look at these patches and ignore those patches and then people can do this task. So when the, when the, when the motions are moving up, then they can do the uh, big or small task. And when they're moving down, they can do the odd even task. And now what's interesting is, what about the motion in the irrelevant patch that they are told to ignore and not to look at them? It doesn't matter, it doesn't help you actually, if anything, it hurts you. And they know that, and it turns out that that actually can influence your task as well. And we know that it's not just because per peripherally they, they look different, so if something moves up, something moves down, it's harder to see, because we know that their ability to see the attended patch is actually constant, because the unattended patch is also quite weak here. It's unattended and also is kind of near, near perceptual threshold. And what, we, what happens is if they're incongruent, again, if you're being explicitly told that the dots are moving up, you're doing the big or small task, and then if the other numbers are moving down, if the other dots are moving down, so you actually, the idea is that you're being tricked to also prepare for the alternative task or odd even, then you're kind of in a conflict, and then your reaction time goes up, and you're also your D prime, which is a, a measure of your, uh, your accuracy, basically, also goes down. So you're less good at doing the, the number judgment task, and you're slower too. So it seems that your unconscious information can prime you to do an alternative task here as well. I talk a lot about this task paradigm, I like it. I mean, there is something kind of cute and, and, and neat about this task, but of course it's just one case. And I mentioned that some other people have done like inhibition, and, and still that's also, you can collectively call these cognitive control. So maybe just like, you don't need conscious, you don't need to be conscious of the relevant information to do cognitive control. But life is not just about cognitive control. Cognitive control is quite important, I think. If you don't have it, it's quite a big trouble. And we humans tend to be proud of that. We think that you know, other animals are not as good in cognitive control as we do. But there are other things like uh, thinking about what to get married and stuff like that. Maybe those really require consciousness. And of course, it's hard to get people to do, think about getting married in the, in the, in the fMRI scanner. Also, we usually want them to do 100 trials. If you think about getting married for 100 times, it, it would get a bit boring. Uh, you probably decide after maybe three trials. <laughs> and, uh, so, so we have a review to review not getting married, but other tasks that may be relevant to everyday life, such as like cell motivation. Can you actually, if you see a stimulus, I tell you that this is, a lot is at stake in this trial. If you win this trial, you get to pay $100. If, you, uh, if I present another stimulus, you say, well, this is not really important. And so about this kind of motivation, is it important? And, uh, and pursuit of goals and, and learning, uh, mental arithmetic. So mental arithmetic is something that uh, earlier I've been mentioned by Al. It's not my own data, actually. It's my, it's my colleague, Ryan Hassan, who has some data that is actually so far unpublished, but we, have, we replicated some of it too. And I'll give you the anecdote. The story was when we write the review, we, we put some of these functions in, 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 the, in the paper. We said, well, you know, it seems that unconsciously you can do quite a lot, so it's quite interesting. Maybe you don't need consciousness. And the reviewer wrote back and said, well, yeah, I know you have some nice examples there, but clearly something definitely requires consciousness. For example, mental arithmetic. And then we just say, okay, is it really true? We go and look for the literature and ask my friend. It turns out that you can actually do that unconsciously too. And my, my feeling is exactly that. If you ask me another one, I listen to some examples. So you say, well, okay, these are okay. 
but I'm sure that there will be some other functions such as x that you would not be able to do consciously. My bet is if you actually wait long enough, someone will find the evidence that you can also do these unconsciously. So what's going on? That seems to be quite annoying because if, if that's really true, that any function x, if you wait long enough and try hard enough, you can find some evidence that unconsciously you can drive those functions, then it raises the question, why do we need to be conscious at all? Right? Why are we even conscious? Maybe we, we, we can be completely unconscious. And again, I'm talking about consciousness in a very specific sense. I'm not talking about like automaticity, etc. So sometimes consciousness is just defined as anything that is not automatic. I'm talking about subjective visual perception of the stimulus. Uh, or perceptual. So why do you need to be perceptually aware of the stimulus if, un if you're completely unaware of them subjectively, if they can still drive those functions? Why are we just not completely unaware like zombies? Um, and the answer, I think, this is a pretty good answer. Well, maybe you need consciousness to fully exercise these functions. So all the evidence I show you here earlier, these are weak effects. So when you have unconscious information, you can only do the task like slightly above chance. It's not like you can do it fully, completely, very well. Um, but then the answer, the reply, if you really want to take the skeptic's view to say that there's no function, you would say, well, the, the, the table is tilted. Because when you set up these experiments, these subliminal effects got to be small because the way you set them up is such that the, the, the stimulus is weak. Uh, because how do you make the, the stimulus unconscious? It's not, it's, it's not usually you're consciously seeing them, right? So usually you mask them. You present them in the periphery, you present them very briefly, or you drag up the subject, you, you somehow do something that is kind of slightly funny to the brain to make sure that you don't see them. So how do you know you're just knocking out consciousness? You're not just knocking out the signal itself. So you kind of expect these signals have to be small, and so you expect these effects have to be small too. And small effects, of course, are very problematic because small effects are very difficult to distinguish from no effects. Because small effect means that you need a lot of power to detect, right? So you have a small effect, it could be masked by noise. So maybe you need 100 subjects to see those effects. And in psychology, when it comes to these kind of things, we tend to be underpowered. And then it's really a big problem because that means that null effects are very hard to interpret. So as I said earlier, people have found no results for these kind of cognitive control tasks. And again, I think likely because these effects are small, so maybe you need to do it very properly. You need very clean test tubes, metaphorically speaking, or maybe you need a lot of subjects to do it. So when you have a null effect, it's kind of inconclusive. And when you have a high power, when you have a null effect, you can be quite sure that the effect is really not there, but you really don't know. And when you have a positive effect, it may be a publication bias as well because it's a small effect. So the idea is that when you, if your effect actually center on zero, this is a distribution of your effect, if in general your effect is actually not, nothing there, when you have a negative effect or a null effect, you tend to not publish it, and you, because you don't know how to report a null effect when you expect it to be small anyway, it's very not conclusive, so you don't report that. And when you sometimes get a positive effect, you send it to nature and science and think, well, this is really surprising. And actually, maybe you take all of them together, maybe on average there's no effect. I'm not saying this is true, I mean, because I, I tend to be the one who try to claim that unconsciously can do a lot, but I'm, even I'm on this side, I find it very hard to actually be conclusive about this. So in the last minute, I, I give you a proposal of what to do uh, and, and some evidence that you can actually do it. And the idea is this, you want to keep the signal constant. You, you don't want to have the, basically, it's, in general, when you try to show that it's unconscious, your perceptual information is D prime equals zero. People are at chance at distinguishing uh, discriminating the, st the stimulus. And then when you play with such weak signal, you've got to have weak effect. I want to get rid of that. So you basically want to have a normal signal. Uh, you want to keep this perceptual signal constant and somehow manipulate your subjective experience independently of the signal. If you can knock out the awareness without knocking out the signal, that would be great. And if you can do that, then you can see whether in the condition when you have higher subjective awareness, without a higher signal, keeping signal constant, whether that would drive a certain function, let's say cognitive control, then you can actually see whether subjective awareness is contributing to that function. So the logic, I think, is pretty, is pretty nice, and I was at some point very proud of it. The problem was, how do we do that? How do we actually manipulate the subjective awareness without changing the signal? That seems to be asking for the moon. Uh, so in the last few years, we have tried to do that. And I give you a kind of intuitive example of how it works. Think about inattentional blindness. Some of you would know this, right? So if you, haven't, if you haven't seen this before, I'm sorry, I'm going to ruin it for you because you will never be able to see it again. But the idea is that if, you, if you're doing a very engaging task, such as counting basketball passing between people in white t-shirts, ignoring the basketball passing in, in people in, between, black t uh, between people in black t-shirts, 
then half of the subjects would miss very salient events, such as a guy in a gorilla suit walking to the center of the screen, beating his chest, doing a little wiggle dance, and then walking away. Half of the people completely don't see it. And I find it fascinating, and I think it's indeed very fascinating. But the most fascinating thing to me is the fact that you are very surprised. You're blind to this blindness. So if you actually try, you can try it on your friends and go to YouTube and try an attentional blindness, which is these kind of experiments called. What happens is when people miss the gorilla, they don't say, well, I wasn't paying attention. What's the big deal? They say, well, no way. There's no way there's a gorilla. In the sense that their deep prime is very bad, the signal for seeing the gorilla is very bad. But subjectively, they do not think that they don't see it. Kind of subjectively, they inflate. They think they see more than they, they actually do. So yeah, there's a dissociation between subjective and the signal. And in a recent paper, we have actually capitalized on this and did a kind of slightly complex psychophysics experiment that I'm not going to go into. But uh, essentially, the idea is this. When you are not paying attention, you actually have a lot of noise in the system. And when you're paying attention, you have actually less variance. So this is a signal detection theoretic plot that if you don't, are not familiar with it, you can ignore it and watch me. And think about you have a, you have a threshold for subjective perception that is fixed. If you have a very, con you have a very consistent signal that is very high signal to noise, that, that signal may not cross that threshold very frequently. But whereas if you actually have more noise in the unattended case, when you don't pay attention, you have more noise, actually it might cross the signal more frequently. So it's a, in a way, it's a kind of simple case of stochastic resonance, and we have actually demonstrated psychophysically it works. So when you don't pay attention, it turns out that you have more variability of the signal. So it turns out that subjectively, you are more confident, even though you're actually worse at doing this task. And we can actually use uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to inject a magnetic noise into your, directly into your visual cortex and cause this kind of double disso dissociation as well. So essentially, we zap people's head in the back of the head while they're looking at a very small stimulus. And under certain parameters, we can actually make them do the task worse. And yet, they're more confident. And again, the, the principle behind, we actually model it with psychophysics. The, the principle behind is that because you're injecting noise, so when there's more noise, the signal becomes more corrupted. So you're actually worse at doing the task. But because of more noise, it fluctuates more. It crosses your criteria more, your threshold more. So subjectively, you, are more, you, you think you see more clearly, but actually you're worse at doing the task. So, so I summarize. It's a, it's a bit funny to summarize, because the two things seem not to connect so well, but I, I'm going to tell you why. So intuitively, if you take the common sense, consciousness seems to have some very special functions, right? So we all think that consciousness is good for control, thinking. But that might be kind of like a user illusion. We are conscious, and we think consciousness is good. We've never been a zombie. Maybe the zombie would tell you, no, I'm a zombie, but everything can be done unconsciously just as well. But we would never know that, right? So intuitively, introspectively, we are kind of biased. So if you look at the real data, that actually there is no very decisive evidence that consciousness is good for anything. It's not like the con there is some decisive evidence that consciousness is not good for anything either, because those effects tend to be weak. It's actually very hard to interpret them. So we actually don't know what consciousness is. We're in a situation where the jury is really out. But I suggest that maybe the future is to not to do more subliminal priming experiment to show that unconscious stimulus can actually drive very, fun very function, because you, you expect to get small effects that way. And I've done a lot of experiments. I still have unpublished data on this. So it's kind of funny for me to say that. But, but I think that really may not be the future. The future may be to do the kind of thing where you can directly manipulate subjective awareness and keep the signal constant. It is very difficult to do. And what I just did today is I give you a little bit of hint how it could be done. And we haven't even done those experiments yet. And if you can beat me to it, I'll be very grateful. So thank you.